Luke chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. So it was, as the multitude pressed about to hear the word of God, that he stood by the lake of Genesaret, and saw two boats standing by the lake. But the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. Then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and took the multitude from the boat. When he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and lend down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish and their net was breaking. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. So when they had brought their boats to land, they forsook all and followed him. This morning I want to speak on the subject, fishing supernaturally, naturally. Fishing supernaturally, naturally. Father, anoint the ministry of your word this morning, enlighten our darkness. In Jesus' name, and somebody says a very loud amen. amen. Very wonderful story here of Peter. An experienced fisherman having an encounter with Jesus. And never before in all of his experience of fishing did he ever had such a success at it. This success was not natural. This success was supernatural. Now there's no doubt about it that there are principles of natural success. If you practice those principles, you will certainly get results. If you're a fisherman and you want to fish... You must know that there are certain few things that are very, very important. And Rick Warren in his book, Purpose Driven Church, enunciates a few of this. I just want to touch on them, mention them, and touch on them. Number one, know what you are fishing for. There are different types of fishes in the world. You do not have just one type of fish. So you should know what you are fishing for. Global Harvest Church fishes for the Lagos John and Janet. If you go through our membership class, we tell you about this Lagos John and Janet. For our church, our focus is on young people. There are either these young people, are mostly students and young graduates. They are our primary target as a church. Are you saying you don't want me pastor? I didn't say so. You don't belong to that category? We want you. The majority of this category are between the ages of 18 and 35. Let me ask this question this morning. If your age is between 18 and 35, wave your hands to the Lord and just worship the Lord in this house. 18 to 35, you will see the vast majority of this congregation. However, if you don't belong to that category, you are still welcome to church. That's why we are managing uh, people like Pastor Tom uh, in this church, praise God. Evergreen people like him. Glory to God. I want you to know, we are not managing you. I was just joking. We want you also in the church. I am not within 18 to 35 myself. I am turning 50 next year. And yet, I am allowed into Global Harvest Church. Praise God. I'm just telling you how old I am. I'm not saying that uh, you should start preparing for rice and soup. <laughs> So, so I am also managed in this church. No, I'm also welcome in this church. So if you're above that age range, you are welcome. However, there is a principle of homogeneity that says like attracts like. So it is very, very important you know what you are fishing for. The needs of young people below 18 are different from the needs of those in their 20s. Different from the needs of those in their 30s. People in their 20s and 30s have slightly different needs from people in their 40s and 50s. 
These are different stages of life. And when you are over 70 or you are an octogenarian, certainly your needs are different also. And so the type of fish that you want to catch is very, very, it's very important that you know that particular type of fish so that you can devise an appropriate strategy to reach the fish. Praise the Lord. So know what you are fishing for. Even this applies to business. If you have a product, you need to know the target market for the product. Not all products are appealing to market. Why do you think telecommunication companies focus a lot on young people when they are promoting data? Because they know young people are the ones who use data the most. They use it for Facebook, for Twitter, for WhatsApp, for Snapchat, for other forms for Instagram and other forms of social media. They are always on these social media platforms. When we got phones, years ago, cell phones, we were very excited to have cell phones because with our cell phones, we were able to talk to one another and talk, 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 talk. The teenagers of today don't want to talk. They want to chat. Hallelujah. And somebody just thought about the fact that their parents are always peeping at their WhatsApp chats and Twitter chats and Facebook, so this Snapchat for them. So that one, they chat, then the thing disappears from them very quickly. So young people like that, and they majorly have migrated from what's up to that one. They love it. Praise God. Daddy cannot catch them on that one. Mommy cannot catch them on that one. Praise I used to scoop my children's Facebook pages, and then ask them the question, who was that person that posted something on your wall? Who was that person that you were chatting with, you were talking to? We Snapchat right now. I'm completely ruled out. <laughs> Hallelujah. So know what you are fishing for. The needs at different levels are, dif you know, are different. Number two is go where the fish are biting. And these principles, while they are also very related to business, are related to evangelism. If I want to win souls, I should know what I'm fishing for. I should know the type of people I am trying to reach. I should understand them. Now the second point here is know where the fish are biting. Fish don't feed everywhere. Some fish like to operate under the rock. Some of the fish like to operate in still waters. Some of the ship like to operate in running, rushing water. So you need to understand where the fish are biting. The souls that you want to reach, where can they be found? For instance, the young generation we are seeking to reach in Global Harvest Church are very much on social media. Anyone not trying to reach them through social media is not going to reach them effectively. While it is good to go to the streets and look for them, and that is very crucial, we must continue to go to the streets because everybody is found, or most people are found on the streets, not everybody. Praise God. Then we must realize, however, we must find them where they are. If you want to reach the top echelon of the society, you want to reach, uh, you want to reach the, the rich, for instance, you will not find them on the streets. Rich people hardly walk on the streets except they are jogging. And if you disturb them, they will fight you when they are doing so. But they are hardly on the streets. They are not just even on any streets. Where I live right now, you can't even get into the estate except I call them to allow you in. So, except you know me very, very well. There's no way you can evangelize me in my house. You will not even find me. Praise God. It will be very difficult. So whoever wants to reach them has to find where he's going to reach them. Why? You go where the fish are biting. The question is, where do you find those kind of people? I remember a time Oral Roberts, a very great evangelist who's gone home to be with the Lord right now. He, was, he, was, he, was, he lived old into his 90s before he went home to be with the Lord. But God used him to win souls a lot around the world. Oral Roberts, at a particular time, living in the city of Tulsa, wanted to connect with the city and just couldn't find the people he was looking for in church easily and so on. He joined the Rotary Club. Man of God, joined the Rotary Club. Why? Because he knew at Rotary, he was going to find them there. At Rotary, he was going to be able to co connect with them. And at Rotary, he was able to win some of them to the Lord. And some of them became partners of his ministry. So you must find out where the fish are biting. If I'm a student and I want to win souls, then once in a while, I will go to the SUB. I can find the guys there. If I want to win cult boys, cult boys always go to the SUB. 
Then I go there to look for them. They can find, be found also, also in their rooms anyway. I can corner them at the right time in their rooms to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. So go where the sheep are biting. Where can we find the souls to save? Go there. This is just very simple. Even in sales and in marketing, if you have a product to sell in your business, where do you take your business to? You take your wares to where the, those who need them are found. You don't, you don't display your wares in the wrong place. You don't sell them in the wrong place. So you have to adapt. You've got to speak the language that people understand. You've got to speak the language that they can relate to. You've got to package things in a way that they can connect with. And that's why when they want to sell something to children, they make the packaging very colorful. Is that not so? Plenty of colors. Once it looks colorful and attractive, children want it. Anything that looks colorful. So, uh, so when it comes to cultural, uh, uh, when it comes to children, for instance, you use many colors. If a child sees something that is edible, for instance, and... Um, and what is edible and, 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 it's, and it's packaged with different colors, the child will automatically assume that it is very sweet. Even now that you're an adult, when something is packaged in any colors, don't you just assume that it is sweet? Color is sugar. <laughs> color, color tastes very nicely. And so uh, you, it's, it's all adaptation to culture. So you must think like a fish. Principle number four, Catch a fish on their own terms. You can't catch a fish on your own terms. It must be on the term of the fish. It's like a man who has a product and is not concerned about the terms in which the customer wants the product. He will never be able to sell. You can't sell your product to me on your own terms. It has to be on my terms. You have to give it to me the way I want it. Otherwise, I won't buy it. I remember uh, a young man whom I pastored years ago, and he was a youth pastor in my first pastorate. He, he was managing an eatery here in Lagos many years ago, before he relocated to England. And he told me one time, I, I liked eating there. He, they, they were selling this very nice burger. And I liked eating the burgers, burger in that particular eatery. So every now and then, when this church was still in its formation, we will come into Lagos. It was one of those places where I went to eat. I always wanted to eat the burger and the chips. In those days, my body could handle them, praise God. Right now, I'm banned. And I will eat this burger and chips there. No, one day I went, I went there and he told me, he said, this place is about to fold up. I said, why? He said, we're not selling as well as our other competitors are selling. He said, we have told the owners of the franchise that they should uh, inc include some Nigerian cuisine especially jollof rice. He said the vast majority of people who come into this place ask us whether we have jollof rice. And jollof rice is not part of the menu. So we said, let's introduce it. They said, no, it's only the menu from South Africa that we are going to add her to. Needless to say, that business folded up at the end of the day. Why? They were trying to catch fish on their own terms. They were trying to get customers on their own terms. They were trying to sell products on their own terms. When you want to do evangelism, you can't do it on your own terms. It has to be on the terms of the fish. For instance, uh, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you want to catch a fish and you put biscuits or chocolate on your hook, will the fish come there? The fish will never come there. Fish don't eat chocolate. Fish don't eat biscuits. You are the one that eats biscuits and chocolate. You are the one that likes biscuit and chocolate. Tilapia does not like it. Red herring does not like it. Salmon does not like it. Mackerel fish does not like it. Uh, a, a barracuda does not like it. Croker does not like it. Titus. Uh -uh. Titus. Titus. Help my biology. You say a fish called Titus. <laughs> Maybe because I said mackerel. There is a real living fish called mackerel, but there is no living fish called Titus. <laughs> Titus is processed fish. 
Hallelujah. I have to put a worm on the hook such as the tilapia likes for it to eat it. Number five, use more than one hook. If you want to catch plenty of fish, then use more than one hook. Use several hooks in the varieties and uh, to be able to get them. In other words, use, let us use different strategies. Go into the streets, knocking on the doors of houses has worked for hundreds of years and they are still working. Otherwise, Jehovah's Witness will have closed shop by now. But the reason why they carry those bags, those briefcases all the time and they show up in front of your house is because it's working. It's working. It's still working. It does not work for every type of person and every type of target, but it's still working. So, since it is still working, let's keep doing it. But that's not the only thing that works. The moment some people see you carrying that briefcase, they think you are Jehovah's Witness. Even though you are harvested, they don't want to talk to you. So you have to find some other ways to reach such people. You have to invite them for some, for some gospel entertainment in church. Probably some musical or some drama program. And then now they are now ready. As far as they are concerned, they are going to relax. And then they can get the word of God preached to them in the course of the service. There are people you have to invite to love feasts. They are not ready to listen to you preach to them, but they are ready to eat your food. When they come to eat, they will hear the gospel. We'll tell them before you eat the physical, eat the spiritual. And they have an opportunity to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. There are people that need to be reached, like when you check evangelism styles. You will see all those styles that I, that, that I explained in, in the chapter on evangelism styles in my book, Evangelism That Works. You can be like Matthew the tax collector. Matthew was an influential person. Matthew was a wealthy person. Matthew was a popular person. So when Matthew gave his life to Christ, Matthew threw a party for his friends. And his friends gathered together. And Jesus used that method also. If you see Jesus, Jesus used several methods to win souls. He did personal evangelism like he did one-on-one -on -one with a woman by the well of Samaria. Or like he did with Nicodemus. But Jesus did mass evangelism like he will do speaking to multitudes at one time. The Sermon on the Mount, he was speaking to multitudes. But at the same time, Jesus often visited homes. He often visited people's homes. And when he visited those homes, he shared the gospel in those homes. He went to the house of Matthew, the tax collector, and shared the gospel. The Bible says that his friends were there plentifully. Matthew, tax collector, a typical tax collector, was a very, very corrupt man in those days. And of course, because he was wealthy, he would have a lot of friends. So this guy had a lot of friends. And Jesus went into his house. He ate. He drank with them, connected with them. The Pharisees treated those people with disdain. The Pharisees had a holier-than-thou attitude towards them. They didn't want to touch them. They didn't want to talk to them. They didn't want to have anything to do with them. Jesus was different. So much that the Pharisees labeled him glutton and wine biber. Said so this one is always eating and drinking. So he said to them, when John the Baptist came, not eating and drinking, only eating locusts and wild honey. You said he had a demon. Now the son of man has come eating and drinking. You say he's a glutton and a wine biber. In other words, like the song of Obey, there is no way you go about it. People will always indict you and accuse you. If you don't ever want to be criticized, don't live your life. Just disappear from this planet and don't try to do anything significant with your life. Like that song. Anything. There's nothing you do that you will be able to satisfy human beings. They will always criticize you. Always. Any decision you make, somebody will always have something to do with it. <laughs> Look at it. Look at the way they are doing it now. Look at what they are saying now. And then they will complain. It's normal. Praise God. Even in church, it's the same thing. Pastor is used to that one. Amen? Yeah. Any move we make, he says, you see what they do there? When they did the correction, he says, is that what we ought to do right now? <laughs> Instead of doing another medical outreach. He said, they're decorating the place. And if we don't decorate it, you see the whole place. Can't they see the rug? Everything is torn. And they say, excellence. 
It's the same thing. I'm telling you. I know church people. Praise God. No matter what you do, somebody will have something to say. Hallelujah. I love church people. Praise God. Love them. <laughs> These principles that I've shared with you are natural principles of fishing. But beyond the natural, never ever forget that the task of evangelism is supernatural. Secondly, never ever forget if you're in career or in business and you're a child of God, the Holy Spirit wants to be involved with every area of your life. When I was studying from John chapter 14 years ago, verse 15, where Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments and I will pray the Father and he shall send you another comforter. I was looking, I was studying that word comforter. Paraclet in the Greek or, or parakletos. The word para in the Greek it means one called. Kletos means on one side. It is a combination of two words in the Greek. But in studying it, I discovered that the word took its origin from the judiciary. In other words, a parakletos could be described as an advocate. In fact, the word parakletos means one who, who carries the cause of another and helps him. Who carries on the cause of another and helps him. Parakletos means an intercessor. At times he's a go between two people. Parakletos means a solicitor. And the solicitor represents you legally. He can sell your land on your behalf. He can, he can do business on your behalf. In a wide sense, according to, 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 to a great Greek scholar J.N. Darby, he said in a wider sense, the word paraclet means the manager of one's affairs. The Holy Spirit has come into your life and he wants to be the manager of your affairs. Manager of your marital affairs. Manager of your spiritual affairs. Manager of your professional affairs. Manager of your business affairs. And manager of your evangelistic affairs. He wants to be involved in every area of your life. So far, the affair is your affair. I hope you know what I mean by affair now. So, <laughs> praise God. There are some affairs the Holy Spirit does not manage for people. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. But he wants to be a manager of your interests. Yeah, that's a safer word. A manager of your interests. No matter where your interests are, the Holy Spirit wants to be involved and he wants to manage them for you. The touch of the supernatural, therefore, can be on anything you do and so the results will go beyond the normal. The results will go beyond the ordinary. On Wednesday, we discussed evangelism in partnership with the Holy Spirit. We had a wonderful time here. Try to get the CD and listen to it. Evangelism in partnership with the Holy Spirit because he wants to be involved. Now we are looking at a wonderful story here. It's the story of this fisher, Peter, the experienced fisherman. All the natural uh, principles of fishing that we have just enumerated, Peter knew. And Peter had tried each and every one of them, and yet he caught nothing. He failed despite his wisdom. He failed in spite of his experience. He failed even though he had worked very hard. And there are times when we look at our lives, and our lives become a puzzle to us. Because you've done everything there is to do, and yet you do not have the results. People at times, in describing their problem, describe their problems as turning them into ignorant people. One, somebody told me some time ago, he said, now it just looks as if I don't know how to do it anymore. I used to have results in business. I used to have results in ministry. Now the results are not coming anymore. I look like somebody who is ignorant. I look like somebody who lacks skill. I look like somebody who is dumb. I look like somebody who is incapable. I look like somebody who really does not know what to do. At times, life can become a puzzle. For Peter, he was facing a puzzle like that. When he was washing his net, he and his co-collaborators, co-fishermen, experienced while washing their nets. But change was on the way for Peter. And I want to announce, change is on the way for you. 
I shared how I did evangelism in 1986. That was when I started personal evangelism. I did evangelism January, February. Two whole months, not a single convert. I preached to many people, not a single convert. Then I went to seek the face of the Lord. Lord, what is happening in my life? Why am I not getting converts? And what he told me changed to my life. If you look at what happened to Peter here, the Bible tells us how Jesus came to the shore and he was interested in preaching the gospel. And he looked at the crowd. There was no way he could stand in a place easily. And all of them would be able to hear him. There were no public address systems. There were no microphones in those days. No amplifiers. No loudspeakers. So how are they going to be able to hear my voice? Jesus used a natural method. What he did was he borrowed the boat of Peter and asked that they should thrust it off the shore a little. So they trust Steady a little off the shore into the water so that whenever he is speaking, the waves of the river, the waves of the ocean will take his voice and disperse it to the hill. Disperse it to the shore. And everybody will be able to hear him. That was what Jesus did there. But the fact that he used the boat of Peter was what was going to change his life. When you've done all you know to do and you're not getting results in evangelism or you're not getting results in your life, then I want you to know you need the presence of Jesus. The supernatural presence of Jesus Christ makes the difference in our lives. For two months, I made the effort. For two months, I preached. For two months, I obeyed the Great Commission. And for two months, I failed. No result whatsoever. This story tells me that your failure is not final. I said, this story tells me that your failure is not final. The fact that you tried and it didn't work the first time and it didn't work the second time and it didn't work the third time does not put finality to the matter. The devil is a liar. There is still hope of a tree. If it be cut down at the scent of water, it will sprout again. For as long as there's breath in your nostrils, there is hope for your life. For as long as you are still alive and you're still kicking, God can still move on your behalf. For as long as you're still here, the devil has not yet had his way you, the fact that you failed does not make you a failure there is still a hope for you in evangelism, in business, in marriage in whatever you do you can still succeed at the end of the day shout the loudest amen if you believe it